My name is Deepan Shaw. I'm the uh, uh, director of cardiovascular MRI at Houston Methodist Hospital. And uh, I think our initial speaker, Dr. Suman Chang, uh, got tied up a little bit because of an emergent TEE. So we're going to swap the order here a little bit. And I'm going to present first on uh, uh, MRI imaging of the heart. And then hopefully by that time, Dr. Chang will be here to talk about CT and nuclear. So let me uh, get started, uh, first of all, by uh, I presume all of you are first-year cardiology fellows, is that right? Anybody who's not? You're sec second year? Oh, so we have some first and second year. And where you're at, uh, how many of you have access to cardiovascular MRI at your institution? Raise your hand. So most of you, it looks like, do. So if you don't. Um, so, so hopefully this will be more of just kind of a, a, an overview of what the technology can do. Now, obviously, you know, if you look back, you know, cardiac imaging has a, a rich heritage uh, with echocardiography coming about in the, eight, in the 70s, uh, nuclear medicine, uh, nuclear cardiology in the 80s, and then really cardiac MR and cardiac CT, I think, are the two techniques that have come uh, into the mainstream uh, in the 21st century. Um, obviously, it all begins with an MRI scanner. Uh, this is just an example of one of the scanners that we have in our cardiovascular MRI laboratory. Um, and you can see, so it's a little donut type machine. The patient lays on the table. The table then goes uh, into the room. Um, and you'll notice at the, the foot of the bed, there's a set of headphones here. These are very important because uh, if any of you have been around an MRI scanner, you know it can make a lot of loud banging noises. And so it's important both to protect the patient's ears um, and also at the same time allows us to be able to communicate with the patient um, uh, throughout the procedure. Um, now, one thing that's always important to recognize from a safety standpoint is the magnet's always on. So it doesn't matter if you go there at 2 o'clock in the morning and the lights are out and everything. The magnet's always on, and the reason to remember this is because if you forget it, it's a disaster. All right? It's a very strong magnetic field, and what happens is metallic objects, as they get closer and closer, they actually speed up. So they become a projectile, and there's cases of of deaths that have occurred. So the number one thing is, if you ever get called down to a code in the MRI scanner, it's get the patient out of the scanner. Don't get the emergency team into the room. Now, what's the methodology that we utilize? So obviously, uh, involves use of hydrogen ions uh, for, for most typical MRI imaging, uh, and then a strong magnetic field. And the reason that we use hydrogen or water is because the body is composed almost two-thirds of water. So uh, you get a very strong signal. But the reality is you can do MRI imaging for sodium, for phosphorus, for potassium, for a variety of different uh, elements as well. Now, um, if you go to the uh, ACC website, you can find the appropriate use criteria uh, for cardiac MR. Uh, and I think it's important for uh, everyone to be aware of appropriate use for all of the imaging modalities. Um, because I think what we want is not just to be able to show you that we can generate nice pictures, but you really want to know what is the clinical utility and what's a scenario in which you want to utilize one modality over another. Um, and so what I'm going to try to do is kind of go through some of the areas where uh, it's considered appropriate. And you'll notice, really, it's, it's a montage of a variety of different applications that uh, cardiac MRI can be useful in uh, for cardiac masses, uh, for ischemia testing with perfusion or, or wall motion assessment, uh, RV dysplasia, uh, viability or scar imaging, pericardial disease, uh, aortic diseases, anomalous coronaries, and then valvular heart disease as well. So I think it's, it's one of the modalities that's extremely versatile uh, in that it can really uh, aid in the management and diagnosis of a variety of different conditions. So let's start out with kind of probably the, the one basic thing that we do in cardiology, which is assess LV function. You know, we know that that LV function in and of itself has very strong prognostic value. And CMR, I think, is unique in that it has the ability to measure contractile function, measure ejection fraction and volumes uh, without the need for geometric assumptions. And so the methodology that's utilized here is that we'll actually acquire a series of short axis views from the base of the heart all the way to the apex of the heart. And that's what I've got shown here. So this is the basal most short axis slice, and then every one centimeter, we require sequential slices all the way down to the apex. And then this is a still, flame, uh, still frame of the images in diastole, and this is a still frame of the images in systole. And then simply by contouring the endocardium, we can derive what the endocardial uh, or the end diastolic volume is, 
by summating these, as well as what the end systolic volume is. And then obviously from that, you derive stroke volume and ejection fraction. And the advantage here is that there's no geometric assumptions that are being made here. And as a result, there's a, a number of validation studies in the literature that you can go to going back over the last 20 years or so, showing, in fact, including uh, comparison to cast of cadaveric heart, showing that volumes measured by CMR uh, are highly accurate. Uh, and there's also data showing high reproducibility of these measurements as well. So uh, what's unique, though, is not only can we look at the left ventricle very well, but you also have the ability to look at the right ventricle. Uh, and you can see in these images here that you can see the RV just as clearly as you can see the LV. So there's no issues with uh, artifact uh, overlying the right ventricle. Um, and so we can utilize the same methodology that we used for uh, assessment of left ventricular uh, volumes and ejection fraction and do the same thing by, by planimetry and tracing the uh, end diastolic and end systolic contours to derive uh, right ventricular volumes and right ventricular ejection fraction as well. Now, let me move on to uh, another area, which is in valvular heart disease. And uh, the role for CMR, I think, uh, applies both for stenotic lesions as well as for regurgitant lesions. So with stenotic lesions, here's an example of a patient with aortic stenosis. And the objective really is twofold. One is to derive what is the velocity uh, uh, coming across this aortic valve. And secondly, what is the, the amount of opening of the aortic valve? Now, you'll, note, you'll remember in echocardiography that the way that you derive the valve area is using a, what's called an effective orifice area, which is basically a calculation based on your velocity profiles, whereas with CMR, we actually can directly measure the anatomic uh, valve area or anatomic orifice area. And it's done as, as is shown in this example here, where you actually acquire serial short axis uh, thin slices uh, across the aortic valve. You identify these short axis slices, and then you find the location that shows the smallest maximum opening during systole. And that's going to be the most narrow part of the valve. And that's what your anatomic orifice area is, as is shown in this example here, uh, anatomic orifice area of 0 0.71. So again, this is independent of any velocity assessment. And then with CMR, um, you can also, in addition to that, uh, uh, measure the velocity across the valve as well and derive peak and mean uh, velocities and mean gradients as well. So you've got two kind of independent methodologies by which you're assessing severity of aortic stenosis. Now, um, using this phase contrast technique that I touched on, uh, we can also utilize this, in fact, to measure volumes uh, or measure flow. Um, not only can we use it to measure the velocity of flow, but you can actually use it to measure the total amount of flow by simply drawing an ROI and integrating each individual pixel uh, at each frame in the cardiac cycle. And then it actually generates for you now a flow curve, which is shown here. And then the area underneath this curve represents the amount of flow that's crossing this imaging plane throughout a cardiac cycle. Um, and so again, this doesn't require you to measure uh, an LVOT uh, uh, area or diameter uh, and make assumptions, this allows you to do a direct measurement by integrating essentially uh, velocity and area together. Uh, and, and this data actually has been uh, validated um, both by demonstrating internal consistency in normal patients where you demonstrate that the left ventricular stroke volume by uh, planimetry uh, corresponds to the amount of flow being ejected out uh, across the aortic valve by this phase contrast technique. And then there's also measurements or validations that have been done with flow phantoms. Now, we can use this technique then not only to determine what the forward flow is across a valve, but if you place the imaging volume a little bit above the valve, you're actually able to derive what the reverse flow is uh, in the setting of aortic regurgitation. So you can see in this case here, I have an imaging uh, volume which is placed just slightly above the uh, level of the aortic valve in the aortic root. You derive the forward flow, which in this case was 160 cc's, and you're able to derive what the reverse flow is, which is your aortic regurgitation during diastole, which was 80 cc's, giving you a regurgitant fraction here of uh, 50%. Now, you can utilize uh, a similar but uh, a variant methodology to look at mitral regurgitation. Um, the challenge with mitral regurgitation is to try to directly measure the reverse flow at the valve uh, is going to be limited. And the reason for that is high velocity. MR jets tend to be high velocity, and they can be eccentric. And so as a result, what we use is what's called an indirect methodology, where if we determine what the volume of blood is being ejected out of this ventricle, comparing end diastolic volume to end systolic volume, 
uh, which gives us basically a stroke volume for the ventricle. So in this case, a net stroke volume for this LV is 150 cc's. And we can use that phase contrast technique up at the aortic root to determine how much of that flow is going forward uh, across the aortic valve, which in this case was 80 cc's. And therefore, then, the difference between these two uh, is what the amount of blood is going backwards across the mitral valve. So uh, in this case, it's 70 cc's. The advantage with this methodology is it's not affected by the presence of AI, because you'll notice if you have AI, it, it, it leads to an increase in your LV stroke volume, but it also leads to an increase in your aortic forward flow, because that, that uh, AI uh, reverse flow ultimately comes back forward across the valve. And as a result, these two actually cancel themselves out. So this technique is ideal uh, in the setting when you have mixed valve disease, when you have both uh, AI and uh, MR. And then we use basically the same principles, analogous ways to measure pulmonic regurgitation as well as tricuspid regurgitation as I showed you for the left side of your lesions. Now let's move on to tissue characterization by CMR. Uh, and this is done using a technique that we call delayed enhancement CMR. And to give you a time frame, you know, this is a technique that's been around for about 15 years. Uh, so it's relatively new. Uh, and it operates on the basic principle that when we give gallinium, gallinium tends to concentrate in areas where there's an expansion of extracellular volume. So if you have a, a normal myocardium, you have very nice, uh, intact, nicely packed uh, myocytes, and there's very little extracellular space. And as a result, the amount of gadolinium in normal myocardium is very little. And when we do our imaging, uh, normal myocardium, therefore, will appear black. Now, if you have an acute MI, you now have ruptured cell membranes. Uh, the gadolinium not only goes into extracellular space, but it can actually enter into the cells itself. And therefore, you have an increase in the amount of gadolinium in the setting of an acute MI. And therefore, you get this phenomenon called hyperenhancement uh, in uh, acute myocardial infarction. And then in the setting of chronic myocardial infarction, where these myocytes now are, are destroyed and replaced with a loose collagen matrix, you also have now an expansion of the extracellular space. And as a result, you have an increase in the amount of gadolinium uh, within these areas as well. And so in the setting of chronic myocardial infarction, you also see the phenomenon of hyperenhancement. Uh, and that's really led to this concept in the MR world of bright is dead. Um, let's move on to uh, clinical examples. So this was actually a study published in The Lancet in 2000, showing examples of patients with a known LAD infarction. And you can see an area of hyperenhancement here in the anterior wall, a, a known circ infarct, and a known RCA infarct with hyperenhancement in the corresponding territory. And this imaging was done six to nine months after the index presentation. What you'll notice is that what's unique about MRI, because of the high resolution here, is you're able to go beyond just saying there's an infarct present. In fact, you can quantify the extent of the infarction. So in this RCA, we would say there's about 25% of the wall thickness that's shown infarction. The circumflex has about 50% of the wall thickness that shows hyperenhancement, whereas in this uh, example here, the LED shows nearly transmural uh, or almost 100% infarction. And this grading of the severity of infarction, I think, is important because it really uh, is associated strongly with likelihood of improvement in function, both if we look in the setting of chronic CAD, where you're looking at hibernating myocardium, in the setting of acute coronary disease, where you're looking at stunned myocardium, you can see there's this inverse relationship that for those segments that show no hyperenhancement, there's a much higher likelihood of improvement in contractile function, either after revascularization or after uh, primary uh, PCI, versus those segments that show more than 75% hyperenhancement, where the likelihood of improvement in contractile function is very, very low and close to zero. What's interesting also, is also in the setting of medical management. And, and this was a study we did looking at patients that were not revascularization candidates with ischemic cardiomyopathy uh, for whatever, you know, whether they had non-revascularizable disease or whatever, or patients who had non-ischemic disease. Uh, and, and what we found, in fact, was you have the same inverse relationship with just medical therapy with beta blockers in the setting of chronic heart failure, that there is an inverse likelihood of improvement in contractile function based on the amount of hyperenhancement that's present within any given segment. Now, you will notice, obviously, that beta blocker or medical therapy was not as robust uh, in that the entire curve has shifted downward compared to what you see uh, with revascularization strategies. Um, in addition to uh, using it for ischemic cardiomyopathy, CMR can also be helpful in the setting of restricted or dilated cardiomyopathies, uh, as well as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where you can identify thickness of the myocardium or non-compaction, 
where you can identify extensive trabeculations that are present here uh, in, the, in the apex and the anterior wall. Um, and here's an example of a patient with a restrictive cardiomyopathy. You can see there's hypertrophy of the myocardium, both of the LV and the RV. There's a small pericardial fusion. There's mild left ventricular dysfunction. Uh, but what's most, I think, striking is when you look at the delayed enhancement MRI findings down here, you see this intense pattern of diffuse contrast uptake. So what coronary artery is this? This doesn't match a coronary artery territory, right? So that's the clue here. When you have intense uh, uh, diffuse hyperenhancement, that's a finding that's very classic for infiltrative or amyloid heart disease. And in fact, you'll notice in this case, there's also hyperenhancement of the right ventricle as well as hyperenhancement of the atria. And then for RV dysplasia, again, our, our goals with RV dysplasia are to assess for wall motion abnormalities that you can see present here in the subtricuspid region in this patient. Uh, in addition to that, to identify the presence of RV dilatation and RV dysfunction. And there's specific criteria that you can find uh, in the CMR literature as to, to uh, what's diagnostic of RV dysplasia. Um, so this is kind of a summary slide here. Uh, pointing out, in fact, that the differing patterns of hyperenhancement can be very useful in identifying potential etiologies uh, of cardiomyopathy. Obviously, we know that ischemic disease tends to give you a subendocardial-based pattern of injury, either subendocardium or transmural, whereas uh, uh, infiltrative or amyloid heart disease gives you a global picture. Myocarditis tends to give you an epicardial pattern of enhancement or mid-myocardial pattern of enhancement. And then hypertrophic cardiomyopathy tends to give you a pattern of enhancement where it uh, has a predilection for the uh, septum at the RV insertion sites. Uh, cardiac masses, um, I'm going to skip past this because I don't expect anybody to memorize this table. Uh, but this just gives you an idea of the different imaging characteristics that uh, are present that can help you to identify uh, or at least generate a differential diagnosis in the setting of a cardiac mass. And then uh, lastly, you can also use MRI for vascular disease, for imaging of the aorta, renal arteries, uh, imaging of the uh, aortic dissection, as an example here, and on the right-hand side for uh, 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 performing a complete uh, lower extremity runoff procedure. So again, uh, you know, the appropriateness criteria, I think, are very useful for all the fellows to, to be aware of and to go to. Um, and uh, you know, I think you will find that uh, CMR is a, a useful uh, an important tool that you can add to your armamentarium uh, as you're trying to take care of patients.